Hi, my name is Steve Watson, and I'm the Maricopa County School Superintendent. Thank you for joining us for this week's STEM Pro Live. More than ever, we've been working and learning at home. We are trying new meals and making lifestyle choices. And I'm not sure how much we appreciate the science of food and nutrition. But to help us put these things into perspective and understand the science, we are happy to welcome nutritionist Christy Allickson and Chef Kenneth Moody from ASU College of Health Solutions to help us learn tips about the science of cooking, health, and nutrition. Let's check it out. Hi there, my name is Christy Alexon. I'm a clinical associate professor at Arizona State University and I'm also a registered dietitian nutritionist. Um, what I get to do here at ASU, I get to teach, which is awesome. Um, I teach nutritional biochemistry, so I'm a hardcore science nerd, but I love where science meets health. So I love learning how we can use science to eat healthier, get the most out of our exercise, get the best possible performance when we're exercising and feel the best and um, perform the best in sports and things like that. So that's really fun. Um, I have a PhD in physical activity, nutrition and wellness. So I guess I'm a doctor, but not a medical doctor. Um, so a little bit about how I got here and, and into this position at ASU. Um, I started off as a kid. I, I know this sounds kind of funny, but in the morning, my mom would give me cereal for breakfast, and they were always healthy cereals. My mom was kind of health conscious. And so I would read the labels on the cereal box. Like that was like my morning entertainment. And so I remember seeing like vitamin A, vitamin C, and I would look at the percentages. And then I remember when we were shopping at the grocery store in the cereal aisle, I would look and try to find the one that had the most, like the highest amounts of the different vitamins and minerals, even though I didn't really know what all of them did. I was like in first or second grade, like I was really young. And then as I continued through school, I just kind of found that I had a knack for science classes, like, you know, biology, chemistry. I had some fantastic teachers, both in high school, um, junior high even, and then in college. Um, I went to a high school where you could actually start earning college credits early. So I actually did like calculus, like dual credit through the community college and my high school. So I got my calculus done, my chemistry, my biology, like all my basic science courses kind of finished in high school, which was really nice. Um, then when I went to college, I thought that I wanted to be a medical doctor. I wanted to be a physician. Um, I actually um, got into medical school when I was really young. I think I was like 21 or 22. <laughs> um, and I actually ended up dropping out of medical school. So the reason why I didn't continue in medical school is because I found that my passion was really about um, health and like disease prevention, not, you know, and then managing disease using nutrition and exercise. Like that's what I really wanted to focus on. And so I was a biochem tutor, and then I kind of did the same thing when I was in medical school. I kept tutoring, and then I realized, wow, if I could make a career out of teaching and health and nutrition, it's like I couldn't even believe I get paid to do it. And I still wake up every day and go to work, and I'm like, wow, I really get paid to talk about a subject that I love. And that's in the days I get to teach in the classroom. Nutrition, the great thing about having a career in nutrition is you can do everything from teaching you know, in a college or community college to working in a hospital. You can work in community settings um, and um, you know, help like people in the community eat healthier and, and all of that. Um, private practice or if you're interested in sports, you know, nutrition has a huge impact on sports nutrition. And so another, you know, I, I kind of have multiple careers that I'm doing all at once because that's a great thing. You don't just have to pick one thing. Um, you know, yes, I have my, my you know, teaching job and, and what I do here at ASU, but then I also do consulting work with people that are either their athletes or their recreational athletes. And um, I have people that, you know, they want to run a marathon or they want to, you know, squat or deadlift the most weight they can at a competition. And so we really focus on how do you properly fuel your body for sports um, to make your performance as best as you can. So that's another role that I have. Hello, my name is Kent Moody. I'm the executive chef here at ASU for the nutrition department. So I'm in charge of all of our kitchens downtown and all of our labs for our students. So I'm in charge of the curriculum for hundreds of students every single year coming through. Um, so we run a little small kitchen and we also have a science cooking kitchen. I've been cooking a long time and my cooking career started very, very long time ago. 
My mother was a registered dietitian. She worked at the VA hospitals. Um, so I grew up in these large industrial commercial kitchens. I remember going to work with my mom and seeing these massive, huge kitchens with these huge staff preparing food for hundreds of patients all day long. So that's kind of where I got my first experience cooking, but I never thought that would really be my career. Uh, my father was a Marine Corps drill instructor. So he was a very loving man, but we had a lot of discipline in our household growing up. So that affected me quite a bit. One thing that was very important for us in our home is we would always eat together as a family. So almost every night we would get together at the dinner table and we'd actually have dinner together and talk. So food was a vital part of my life growing up. In school, I did a lot of different things. I was good at math and sciences, um, and I really focused on computer sciences. That's what I thought I wanted to do. So I took a lot of programming courses, anything I could do with computers, I really dug into and I really, really enjoyed. And after two years, I decided maybe that wasn't the best career for me, and I didn't think I really wanted to spend eight hours a day behind a desk. I looked at other things that I really enjoyed, and I kind of always went back to cooking. I love watching cooking shows, I love preparing meals, um, I love eating with other people. So I decided it would be a great opportunity for me to go to culinary school. Um, I invested a lot of time looking at different culinary schools, I decided to go to Le Cordon Bleu. So I went to culinary school after two years of college and I got my associate's degree. After going to school for a year, um, I did an internship, a Thai food restaurant, um, and after working the Thai food restaurant for about a year, I went with a, one of my chefs to a country club. And I very, very much enjoyed working at country club. While we think that maybe chefs, all they do is play with food, a lot of it ends up actually being working with numbers. You have to know exactly what your food costs. You know it, need to know exactly what the food on the plate is costing your business, what to charge your customers, and you have to manage that very, very efficiently. You have to keep track of market trends, knowing what different items cost at different parts of the year, and taking into account shortages and seasonal products. So a lot of my time was just managing our inventory, managing our food, and then managing my staff and my people. So I took this great course on public speaking where you literally had to write speeches and deliver them in front of the class. And that really prepared me later on in my career when I was a chef, training my other cooks. It helps me out every day teaching my students how to properly do stuff, leading a lecture and teaching my classes. A lot of those skills I learned are very, very effective in my everyday environment. So now I am in charge of all of our downtown kitchens. So we have two awesome food science labs. One, where students come in and they work with food and they learn about the science of food every day. Um, in my course, we have a very large capstone project where students actually work over the whole semester and they actually come up with their own restaurant theme and then they actually run their own restaurant for a day. So they have to come up with a menu. They have to write recipes. They have to do food costing. They have to do ordering. They have to come up with production schedules. And then they actually have to manage the other students in their class to perform and create and serve all this food. So it's a great, great learning experience for them. They learn what it's really like being in the kitchen. They learn about all the math and science and scheduling that you have to actually put into running a kitchen on an everyday, everyday environment. All right, that's a good sign. I can see you, Chef. Awesome. Good morning. I think our I think the fifth computer was the charm. So, nice. Well, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, thank you to our audience for being here. Again, my name is Brian Hoffner, and I'm going to host the last portion of this, which is the live question and answer. Uh, we have Chef Kent Moody right here. Good morning, sir. And Dr. Christy Alexon. Good morning. Good morning. And I know that you guys are excited to kind of share um, some of the things that you guys are doing there at the university, but also what are you guys doing right now that we're all kind of locked up at home? And I know that you guys both kind of prepared something for you. I don't know if Chef, we're going to be able to see yours or not, but uh, Dr. Alexon, do you want to talk to us about what do I see behind you there? Yeah, this is this is breakfast. Um, well, a little bit more. I have different options, uh, basically, because I know 
you know, people have different things that they, they like. So um, this is a smoothie that I make for breakfast every morning, and it's packed with a lot of different vitamins and protein as well that's good for your immune system. Um, you know, right now with everything going on with COVID, it's really important to stay healthy and washing your hands, wearing a mask, staying at home. Um, it's going to help with that, but there's a lot you can do to stay healthy from the inside out, and that is all about keeping your immune system um, in the best shape you possibly can. So there are um, important, you know, things in nutrition for your immune system. One is getting enough protein. Um, your immune system has these things called immunoglobulins, and those are actually made up of protein. So if you have poor protein status and you're not getting enough protein, your immune function won't be the best. Um, other things that you really need are vitamin D, vitamin A, and vitamin C. So um, the ingredients that I have in my smoothie are going to address all of this. Um, and one thing I thought was really cool when you were running the, like before we actually got started, you had like all those interesting factoids about nutrition. Um, I saw in there that you have that eggs is one of the highest quality sources of protein, which I, you know, I agree with that 100%. I love eggs. And so the base of my smoothie, um, I actually, you have a couple options. Um, so you could just do milk, for example, milk has vitamin A and vitamin D. So I do have milk as one option that you could start off and you do about one cup of, of whatever protein containing liquid you're going to do. So one cup of milk, if you don't drink milk, um, I also like, um, I use sometimes these liquid egg whites Now you might think, ooh, that sounds gross. You're drinking egg whites. So um, this company that I um, get them from, they actually do a filtration process. So it's real smooth. And they also remove, there's a protein that you find in raw egg whites called avidin, and it binds to biotin, which is another nutrient. And so you don't want to drink white raw egg whites usually, but this is a special one that's pasteurized and it has that avidin, that protein removed, so it won't mess up any of your other uh, vitamins, I guess you could say. So that's another option for your one cup of liquid here, or you could do um, coconut milk or almond, almond milk. So if you're lactose intolerant, you don't do dairy, you could do coconut or almond milk, one cup um, in there. And for my protein, I have egg white protein powder because almond milk is good and so is coconut milk, but it doesn't have a lot of protein in it like, like regular cow's milk, dairy milk. So um, doing a couple scoops of egg white protein powder along with your almond milk will give you a nice little protein boost in your smoothie. So I have one cup of, like I said, some type of protein containing liquid. Um, then to add a little natural sweetness, I do a half a cup of coconut water. So that's what you see here. So that's already in there. Um, now you have to add the rest of the ingredients. And so when you are blending smoothies, um, one thing that you want to remember is you do the liquids first, and then you want to put the ingredients in from the lightest to the heaviest. So the ones that weigh the most go at the top, and it kind of helps you push everything down so your blender doesn't get like clogged up or whatever. So I have my liquid in here, so I have my egg whites, my coconut water. Now to get vitamin A and C, I'm going to do two handfuls of uh, baby spinach and two handfuls of kale. And I know it, it may not sound very good, but I'm telling you once I put fruit in here, it actually, in the coconut water, it tastes a little bit sweet. So it doesn't taste like you're drinking a salad, I promise. But a couple handfuls of those green veggies. Um, and think about like, it would take you forever to chew all that, but it's so much easier to drink it sometimes for breakfast. Okay, now my next ingredient I have a cucumber that I peeled and chopped up, and you might be wondering, you know, why peel the cucumber? Some people don't peel the cucumber, but the, the skin of the cucumber can taste kind of bitter. Um, so depending on how sensitive you are to bitter taste, you might like peeled cucumber better than keeping the skin on. Normally, I like to keep the skin on all my vegetables because that's where you get the fiber, but it's just it makes it a little bit too bitter. So um, go ahead, put the cucumber in there. Now I have a couple other special ingredients for extra good nutrition. Um, I have chia seeds, so close up there. I got these at Walmart. Uh, chia seeds have omega-3 fats. It's a healthy type of fat that's really good for your immune system as well. They also have a lot of fiber. 
and fiber is a very important part of a healthy diet. So I put chia seeds, a tablespoon of chia seeds in there. I also have some hemp hearts that I got at Costco. Um, these ones are another good source of healthy omega-3 fats um, and protein as well. So hemp hearts contain protein. So that's another way to add more protein to your smoothie. So I do a tablespoon of those. We're almost done here. Um, the last thing, I have a, a half cup of frozen mango and a half cup of frozen pineapple. So one cup total of frozen fruit. And it's great because it's already chopped up, you know, when you buy it frozen. So that's nice. So I'm going to put that on top. And now it's going to get a little bit loud for a second here. Here we go. So what I love about this is you're getting like so many vitamins, so many um, great nutrients and this is the start of your day, you know? So, so many of us go the entire day and never have any fruits and vegetables and pretty much I'm getting in one shake for breakfast what, what most people probably may not even get for fruits and vegetables all day long. So I wish I could send it to all of you. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm wondering if you're gonna be delivering that or if I have to come pick that up because that looks delicious. I'll send it, I'll package it up and send it over. <laughs> that looks amazing. I'll start drinking it. I know, so I'm Yeah, so. I, I wouldn't deny you your breakfast. Right? Now I'm going to eat breakfast live. <laughs> Does that come complete with a metal straw too? Mm. Right? I have my mason jar that I like to drink out of with a metal straw. I love it. Like it's, it's, a, um, it's a great way to start the day. <laughs> nice. So Brody Cooper asked, does it have to be frozen? Mm. The mango and pineapple, it doesn't have to be frozen, but it's nice because it makes the smoothie kind of cold because notice I didn't add any ice to it. So it chills it. And also freezing is the best way to preserve um, vitamin C. So vitamin C is very easily destroyed by oxygen. And so like, let's say you go to the store, you can buy pineapple already chopped up. You can buy mango already chopped up. But as soon as you break the skin of the fruit and it's exposed to oxygen, within like 20 minutes or so, all the vitamin C gets destroyed. But if it's frozen, that will preserve it. So that's why I really like using the frozen fruit because it will preserve the vitamin C and it also makes the smoothie nice and cold and, and chilled, which is like, it's, I think it tastes better cold versus warm. Great question. Nice, and I'm gonna ask this question. I think it's gonna go to both of you here. Uh, and this is from Diana Costa, who's a student out in the Peoria School District at Apache Elementary. Um, and, and they wanna know what's your favorite part about cooking? So. Like I'm assuming that you came up with this recipe, but what, you know, what's your favorite part of coming up with these types of things or, or chef coming up with some of the things that you're creating? You wanna go first, Ken? <laughs> hey, Ken, you're muted, hold on a second. Well, my favorite thing is just creating stuff. Um, when it works, like sometimes they don't always work out. Um, I've had quite a few recipes that went a little south on me. But that's kind of this, the joy of cooking and playing around with food. Um, a lot of people, they'll get discouraged if something doesn't work, but you should never, that's, you're just having fun. You're just playing around. Don't ever get worried. Um, I'm a professional and I mess stuff up sometimes. So I think it's just part of the creation process. Yeah. For me, it's, it's fun trying to find foods that are like healthy and have lots of good nutrients for, for you, but also taste good. So talking about not being afraid to fail and mess up. So the first time I tried this, I didn't put any um, fruit in it. I'm like, I'll just make a veggie smoothie. And I'm like, oh, this is kind of gross. <laughs> but um, having just like you said, just like a half a cup of the frozen mango and pineapple and using the coconut water, it adds like a little bit of sweetness. So, but it's not like it has tons of sugar or anything like that, but it's, you want to find that balance of making it palatable, like it tastes good, but it also is good for you. And so I like trying to find that that balance, but you don't always get it right on the first try. I know Chef Ken, we've made like black bean burgers and we've made all kinds of, and sometimes you're like, oh, this is awesome. And sometimes you're like, mm, yeah, it's a little 
<laughs> it's fun. It's fun trying though, you know, enjoying the process of, of learning and figuring out what works and what doesn't. So as you're sitting there drinking that, I know that you kind of listed some of the, the nutrients and the vitamins that are in there. And I have the same, uh, Dinocostia asked, what vitamins are in that smoothie? Yeah, so the vitamins that are in here, there's a lot of vitamin C and a lot of vitamin A. Um, so vitamin C and vitamin A you find in the greens, like the kale, for example, the spinach. Um, mango has a lot of um, vitamin C and vitamin A as well. So um, it's in the form of beta carotene, which is like the precursor to vitamin A. So any orange, um, yellow, red uh, fruits are going to have, like I said, um, the orange, yellow ones have vitamin A in the form of beta carotene. And then vitamin C you find in a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. One thing that's not in this smoothie, that's an interesting factoid for you, is a red pepper, like a red bell pepper, has more vitamin C than an orange, you know? Really? So, um, but I've never made a smoothie with bell pepper before. We'll have to try that, Kent, and see how that turns out. <laughs> it might not be very good. But, but yeah, mostly vitamin A, C. And then if you make it with um, milk, there would be some vitamin D in there as well, which is really good for your immune system too. Great question, thank you. Nice, so uh, Dimitri Gambo wants to know, what's the most healthy foods to eat? Um, I would say fruits and vegetables, number one, you know, because you're getting, like I said, lots of those vitamins and um, antioxidants that are these special, like basically plants make these things called phytochemicals and they protect the plant from, you know, it, things in the environment and all that. It helps keep the plant healthy, but when you consume it, it also keeps you healthy. So um, I think fruits and vegetables are like number one healthy food. And then lean protein is another big one. What would you say, Chef Kent, that you like to? Well, I agree with all that, but I don't like to demonize any foods. I don't think any food is bad in moderation. Um, so I don't like to get in the trap of, well, this food's, better and this food's bad. As long as we eat healthy in general, um, I think we can eat a well-balanced, diverse diet. But Christy's definitely right. You want lots of those fruits and vegetables. Um, good sources of protein really help out too. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's all about balance, variety, and moderation. So like you want to try to vary your diet. Like if all you eat is chicken nuggets, you know, and French fries, like there, there's not a lot of variety there and there's not a lot of balance. Like you're missing some food groups, you know? So really think about, okay, there's fruits and vegetables, there's protein, there's healthy grains that have like fiber in them, like whole wheat bread or whole wheat pasta or oatmeal, for example. Um, the, the different categories, you know, healthy fats like avocados, um, olive oil, you know, um, you want to kind of have a balance of lean protein, fruits and vegetables, healthy fats, and then healthy grains like or, or, or healthy carbohydrates or starches like sweet potatoes, for example. You know, so you think about hitting all those different categories um, and having so it's not just like one thing that you're eating, like I'm only eating oatmeal or I'm only eating eggs or I'm only eating sweet potatoes, you know, or only eating kale. Like, yeah, kale, you know, and spinach, those are healthy, but if that's all you ate like you would not be healthy, you know? So you need kind of everything together and balanced. And I have a demo ready for guys to see. Um, it's a very fun, healthy breakfast that actually hits on all those things we've been thinking about. Um, if I can turn my camera just a little bit. Ooh, there Let's we see. go. Nice. Um, Mother's Day's coming up. So I guarantee your mother would love this dish. We're gonna make some scrambled eggs. Um, so, Scrambled eggs are one of the easiest things in the world to cook. It's very, very, very easy, but people still mess it up a little bit. So I want everyone to pay attention. First, we're gonna add just a little bit of fat. Now I'm gonna use butter, but any sort of fat would work. Now I want you to look, see my pan? It's not melted yet. All I wanna do is just kind of coat the bottom of my pan. When I'm making scrambled eggs, very important that we don't get the eggs too hot. So I don't want my butter super hot. And all I'm going to do is crack a few eggs and put it right in the pan. Now, this is the easiest part. All you have to do is scramble. It's almost as easy as putting everything in a mixer and turning it on. But I think Christy's got me beat a little bit on ease. But see, all I'm doing is stirring. Now, if my pan is too hot, all I do is 
move it away. And I keep stirring. And I move it back and I keep stirring. And I move it away and I keep stirring. And all I do is come right back. Now, eggs are a great healthy protein, but I don't like overcooked eggs. I don't think anyone likes overcooked eggs. So if you're gonna make these for your mom, please don't overcook your eggs. You wanna stop them when they're almost done. Now we're gonna add a little bit of cheese. I'm just gonna use a little shredded cheese blend, sprinkle it in there. And last, I'm gonna add a little bit of seasoning, a little bit of salt and pepper. It's very important you don't add the salt and pepper too early. If you add it too early, it breaks down the egg and it makes these eggs watery and kind of gross and no one wants that. <laughs> we have our lovely scrambled eggs. Earlier today, I broiled some tomatoes. Mm. I have some whole wheat toast with some healthy fat avocados. Yummy. Let me just put some eggs on there. I think that was a 30 second one minute recipe. Oh. I would like to eat that. That looks amazing. <laughs> that looks amazing. So you're, you're kind of doing two things for me. One there with uh, chef is one, we had a, a student, Skylar Downing, who's a third grade student that says, do you have a good thing that a nine-year-old could cook? And I think he just demonstrated that. I think I just did it. my seven-year-old can cook. He's made risotto with me. Um, anything's possible. Food's not hard. Cooking's just adding heat. That's really all you're doing. I feel like anyone can add heat you just want to make sure you have adults supervising you and so you don't burn anything or cause any fires but the principles are very very easy for cooking well i appreciate you showing me the fact that i've been doing my eggs wrong my whole life because i always pre-scramble them and i add salt and pepper before i cook it and now yeah, i know where i'm better. messing up it could be a little better so <laughs> next this weekend when i'm cooking for my wife it'll be much better on sunday so thank you for that so I have, a, I have a question that was coming in, and it's kind of, you guys were talking about this a little bit. Austin Goodjill was talking about uh, veggie burgers. And so not from a lifestyle choice, but from a health choice, if we're looking at veggie, veggie burgers versus regular burgers, what are your guys' thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I think, so I think veggie burgers, there's, it's kind of like there's different kinds, you know, right? And some of them are healthier than others. So um, you would a lot of times you think, oh, just because it's a veggie burger, it's automatically healthier than a meat burger. And that's actually not always true. You know, so you still have to look at the label. Um, knowledge is power when it comes to nutrition and look at that label and see, you know, how much protein is in it, how much fat is in it and use that to decide whether, you know, how healthy it is. So one of the things that I teach my students and my clients is that um, a lot of times what happens is people overdo the fat in burgers. And so I look at the ratio of the amount of protein in the burger to the amount of fat. And so in order for something to be a, a lean protein, which is what we want to get more of, you know, we don't want to do a bunch of high fat proteins, um, uh, but a lean protein. So it shouldn't have more than like 3.5 grams of fat per 10 grams of protein. And a lot of veggie burgers are really great. Like they have plenty of protein and they're not too high fat, but some of them, I've, I looked at the store and I'm not gonna name any specific brand names or anything, but I was shocked because there were veggie burgers that, you know, had more fat and not to say like they could, they could be good fats, you know, like omega threes and all that, but um, you still have to keep that balance, you know? And so um, I have a lot of uh, clients that come to me that are trying to lose weight. And as a kid, you don't need to worry about that or anything. But, you know, you might have family members, older adults, you know, that are like, oh, I'm, you know, trying to lose weight. And they'll they'll switch to like veggie burgers. And they're like, what's happening? I'm not seeing any changes. And it's because maybe they're not picking the, the right types of veggie burgers is what I'm thinking. I've worked with some of the new meat substitute type ground beef stuff. Um, and the taste is pretty close on them. I don't complain too much about that, but you'll find a lot of them have very, very high fat contents. Um, some a lot even higher than the ground beef would find. Um, so I say, just be careful what you're buying. Um, but some of them are very good. I've had some mushroom burgers that are excellent. And like mushrooms are great, especially for people that are, you know, vegetarians, they have vitamin D in them and they're gonna be great for them. Yeah. All right, so we have Ariana Walton, who's super excited. Um, Ariana's 10 and she's excited because she can make scrambled eggs too. 
Um, but Jacob Robenstein, who's a fourth grade student out in Buckeye, uh, had a question about a comment that you made, and it said, did you say you broiled those tomatoes? Ah, yes. If I can get them closer to the camera. I just kind of put them under my broiler with a little bit of olive oil, salt, and pepper, and got that nice char on them. So you'll see they have that nice color, that's caramelization, that's some of the natural sugars in that tomato kind of coming up to the surface. Um, it's kind of like you're making tomato candy, if you will, uh, but it really is great flavor out of them. So um, almost everyone's oven at home has a broil function. I don't know if anyone's ever used it before, but it's just radiant heat coming down from the top of your oven. And I use it a lot to kind of put a little bit of caramelization on food. It's fancy, but easy. <laughs> so Sedona Sather is a student at Cactus View wants to know how long should you boil them? Um, in a professional kitchen, now I know your recipes at home, it says cook for 10 minutes or put in the oven for 30 minutes. We don't use times anymore. Um, when you're a professional cook, you're cooking for temperature or you're cooking for a desired look or doneness. Um, health code, there's nowhere in health code that says cook it for 30 minutes. It's always you need to cook it up to a certain temperature. So with the broiler, you just put it under there, you leave the oven of your door, the oven door open, and you just kind of watch it till it gets that perfect color. So it's just having a good eye. Nice. So, so maybe five minutes. <laughs> maybe five minutes, but we don't do time. That's right. Uh, so uh, Dr. Christie, we have a lot of people that said they were kind of bouncing in and out with your recipe, and they would love to know if, if we could post that for them. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, I'll, okay. I'll send it over. You guys can have it. So we will, we will send that out. Uh, we'll put it on our on our post production too, so that people can see that. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. So we just have a couple more questions. Um, okay, so Sedona wants to know: Are there any recipes I can make for the autoimmune diet? I'm not I'm not sure what that is. Yeah. So basically, there's a there's kind of this theory that there are certain foods that can um, trigger your immune system. And so if you have autoimmune conditions like Hashimoto's thyroiditis is one, um, or rheumatoid arthritis, like there's certain conditions where, so normally your immune system attacks foreign, like bad things that come into your body, right? Pathogens, we call them. Um, but there are autoimmune conditions where your body attacks itself, and that causes a lot of inflammation. Um, and, and can be, you know, really painful and uncomfortable or cause other like health you know, issues and all that. So a lot of things we do for autoimmune is very anti-inflammatory. So one of my good friends has rheumatoid arthritis and, you know, she's, she's not old, but she, she almost feels like, you know, you think about older people having arthritis and their bones hurt and their joints hurt. Well, she's like, you know, 20, 30 years old and she has all these issues. And so doing an anti-inflammatory diet helps her a lot. So um, anti-inflammatory foods are things like salmon and fish, for example. So um, omega-3 fatty acids. So doing um, salmon is really good. Um, doing like those chia seeds and, and hemp uh, hearts that I showed you, those have a lot of omega-3s. So those can be very anti-inflammatory as well. Um, fruits and vegetables, you know, that have, like I said, all those plant phytochemicals, that's also going to help. So um, those types of things are really important and lessening um, foods. So omega-3 fatty acids can reduce inflammation in your body. There are other types of fats called omega-6 fats, omega-6 fatty acids, and they're still essential, like you still need to have them, but you don't want to have too much omega-6s and not enough omega-3s. So normally, if you like fish, like if you do tuna, you know, like having a tuna sandwich or something, you know, like you're getting some some um, omega threes there um, as well, and just not having quite as much of the omega six fats. And so this is where some people will eat less meat to help with that. Although I will say, not all meat is equal, right? So like if you're gonna have a, a burger, let's say, you could have uh, beef where the cows were corn fed versus where the cows were grass fed. And grass-fed beef does have more omega-3s and less omega-6s as compared to like corn-fed beef. Um, Grass-fed beef might be more expensive. Sorry, my have an older dog and he's like coughing. <laughs> um, he's 16. You want, you want to see Bruiser? Hold on, I pick him up. Hold on. Yep, absolutely. This is Bruiser. He's the 
he's the oldest dog and he's coughing. Um, he's half half corgi, half chihuahua. But anyway, he's he's older, so he's still he's still kicking though. He has a healthy diet. He loves oranges actually. Um, uh, but um, you know, so so like I said, those those would be some things that you could do to reduce inflammation. Yeah, great question. So we have time for one last question, and I'm going to borrow it from Isabella uh, Villaverde, who's out at Porter, uh, I believe a fourth grade student. Uh, and they want to know that they, they said they really like to cook, but they're not the greatest. Do you have any tips? And I think I'll just kind of make this broader. What would you suggest to people that they could be doing right now? If one, they just wanted to make this a part of their lifestyle or something that they're doing, or two, they wanted to have a career in this in the future. Oh, no one's good at cooking when they first start. So don't feel bad at all. I was a horrible cook when I first started, um, but you just get better by practice. It's just like any skill you have, the more you do it, the more you get better. Um, right now, since we're in quarantine, um, I've been doing a lot of cooking at home, but I'm doing cooking that I don't normally get to do, like smoky meats, things that take six or eight hours to cook. I just don't have the time to do it. Like I've smoked a pork bud and brisket and ribs and whole chickens um so the point is just kind of doing things maybe you're not comfortable doing and getting better at it it's just a skill the more you work at it the better you're going to get Christy, anything yeah yeah i would say it's, it's all about practice and not being hard on yourself if you mess it up like it's not going to be perfect you know and and even then like you know you would think i'm a I have a PhD in nutrition. I still mess stuff up, you know, like, and that's okay. Like you just learn from it and it gets, it gets a little bit better, you know, every time. And it's, it's more the experience, you know, and trying it that really has the value in it. Like it's okay if it, if it doesn't turn out perfect, but I would say, you know, like I said, practice with the cooking. And then if you're really interested in nutrition, you know, there's lots of great resources, um, you know, on the on the web that you can get to like have good nutrition information. I love this one um, organization. It's called uh, Center for Science in the Public Interest, and they they talk about like really important topics in nutrition and science. And so, you know, that's a great resource as well to learn more. Well, thank you both so much for joining us today. Uh, I absolutely love the fact that we got to have a conversation with you guys and hear more about some tips that we can be doing at home. Uh, I look forward to making my eggs so much better this weekend when I try again. So thank you, Chef. So You're welcome. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. It was fun. Have a good rest sure. of your day, guys. <laughs> and teachers and students and some of our parents that are out there, we will be putting some of these recipes up on our website so you can kind of follow up with that. Um, we'll also be hosting one last Semper Live at home next week with Boeing. Uh, so if you haven't already done so, please go forward and register with that. Uh, teachers, there's also an opportunity to get professional hours for these interactions. So look for that in the survey. There is a link if you're looking for that. Chef, Dr. Christy, thank you so much. We really appreciate you guys. Yeah, bye. <laughs> thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next week with Semper Live at home. <laughs>